it has to be, I guess, almost a demonic irony that we live in the midst of one of the wealthiest cultures that in human history. And yet, <clears throat> there are so many people in our midst, in, in, in our neighborhoods, <clears throat> excuse me, who are being undone by uh, financial issues. We, as we've been looking and thinking about how we might continue to express Christ's mission into our community, uh, we recognize that the whole issue around finance is one of those areas that people wrestle with regularly. And uh, that's why I think it's very appropriate this morning that uh, we have Scott Slingo with us from, from Christians Against Poverty. This is the heart of their mission. This is uh, uh, what they are, have committed themselves to do and are seeking to uh, find churches like us to be a part of what, uh, what they're up to. So uh, Scott's coming today to talk to us about that, and we will be talking to you about, uh, also about uh, some uh, 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 cap money course that's coming up in November. But first of all, let's just welcome Scott as he comes this morning. Thank you, Scott. Well, good morning, everyone. How are we? We're going well. Can I just say that was an incredible worship time this morning. Did, did you really feel like God was in the house today? He was here. His presence was here. That was, uh, it was very, very good. So thank you to the worship team that did such an amazing job. And uh, it is true. It is all about God, isn't it? It's not about, it's not about us. Well, I'm, I'm very excited to be here with you today. And um, a little later on, I'm going to uh, launch... Uh, a brand new ministry in your church, which is our CAP Money Program. So uh, that's always exciting to launch a new ministry. And, uh, and so I'm going to do that a little later on. But while I'm here, I wanted to also talk about some things that I'm incredibly passionate about. And I'll tell you why I am in a few moments. But I'm going to talk a little bit about poverty in the Australian perspective. Um, and, I, and I hope today I will leave you with a a sense of what is actually happening behind the walls of many homes in our nation today. Um, I also want to spend some time talking about something that I'm also equally passionate about, and that's you, the local church. Because uh, I'm a firm believer that the local church is called, is equipped to actually do something about poverty in our nation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then I'll also talk a little bit about what that could look like practically. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the work of Christians Against Poverty. Uh, and also we'll launch the Cap Money program as well. And then towards the end, um, I'm sure there'll be some in the room today that will go, how can I be involved in, in a ministry like this? And so I'll give you some opportunities and some ideas of what that could look like for you. Is that okay? Brilliant. Awesome. Well, let me begin this morning by briefly sharing with you a little bit about my story. It's quite a painful story, but it's an important story because it sort of feeds into uh, what I'm talking about. When I was five, uh, I experienced childhood sexual abuse. And, um, and that uh, literally straight away, instantaneously, changed my life completely. Um, all of a sudden, I learnt guilt I learned about shame, I learned about loss of worth, loss of value, loss of dignity. And, um, and I must admit, as a young, young boy, I had this secret that no one, I mean no one could know about. So I began an inner journey of, um, I guess, living a lie, fundamentally, because I had to um, keep a secret. And so uh, I embarked on life, and what people would have seen externally was a person that seemed to be functioning as normal. But what was going on on, on my inside was vastly different. It was turmoil. Um, it, was, it was very, very hard. And I remember as a teenager involved in some very reckless behaviour. I remember crying myself to sleep at nights because of the pain of, of what had happened to me. When I got to my 20s, I married, uh, had two beautiful daughters, um, and I began a, a, a career in insurance, actually. 
I must have done something wrong to get into the insurance industry, but that's okay. And uh, it was a, a very good career for me. In fact, I was in it for 25 years before I joined CAP. But once again, people would look at me and go, you guys have got it all together. You've got the wife, you've got the house, you've got the career. And that was what I wanted them to think because I didn't want them to know what was actually going on on the inside. Now, I literally was destroying my family. We've all heard the term, hurt people, hurt people. Uh, that was me. And at the age of 36 or 37, my wife looked at me in the eyes one day and she said, Scott, I am about to leave. I cannot put up with this anymore. And I must admit, I was feeling tired. Have you ever tried doing something for so long, being something that you're not? It takes it out of you. I describe it as the, the damn walls burst. And it was only a matter of time before things were going to turn really, really quite ugly. I remember my 10-year-old daughter uh, say to me, looked me in the eyes one day, and I saw pain in her eyes. And she said, Dad, get help. And that was it. That was the, out of the mouth of babes. Uh, I decided to take a courageous journey to own up to the, the, the pain inside and to, ma and to help get help. And so, of course, I did, and my family loved me through that process, and I'm so thankful to my local church who loved me through that process as well. And that's one of the reasons why I'm very passionate about the local church, the love that they can give. God restored my dignity, my honour, and my hope. Um, but he also gifted me something through that process. You know the story of Joseph where he says to his brothers, the things that you did to me were intended for my, my, my pain or my hurt. God has turned that into something for my good. Well, that's the story that I really like to share with you because that's what God has done for me because one of the gifts he's given me is a heart for people who are vulnerable, broken and marginalised because that was me. And so out of something that was quite ugly, God has turned into something quite beautiful. And, and maybe people here today have gone through different things and maybe that's a story, you've got a similar story. Everybody has one and it's very, very powerful. And it reminded me of, um, this. my story reminded me of the story of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 1 Samuel chapter 2 because I, I describe myself as experiencing emotional poverty. That was me. I, I emotionally was, was in a very bad state. And Hannah experienced a physical poverty. She couldn't have children. It, it wasn't just the fact she couldn't have kids, that was the problem. It was the fact that she started to question her worth and her value as a woman. It had an impact in her life. And every day, the other woman would be, the other wife would be reminding her that I can have kids and you can't. And so she experienced a physical poverty. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, we know the story how she gave birth to Samuel and if you keep reading on, she gave birth to three more boys and two daughters. Talking about a transformation. God restored her dignity, her honour and her hope. And in 1 Samuel chapter 2, um, she has this amazing prayer that I really, I love. I love this prayer. And I'm going to read a verse to you and it says this. It says, he puts poor people on their feet again. He rekindles burned out lives with fresh hope, restoring dignity and respect to their lives. A place in the sun. Now, you guys are Queenslanders. You know what it's like to have a place in the sun. You live in it all the time, don't you? For the very structures of the earth are God's. What a powerful verse reflecting the heart of God, our Father, that he wants to see dignity restored into everybody's life, everybody's world, whether it's emotional poverty, whether it's physical poverty, or whether it's financial poverty. And uh, what I would like to do now is talk a little bit about financial poverty here in Australia. Because when I use the term poverty, most of us, if you're anything like me, you automatically think about an African child, that image of what we think is poverty. Um, and when I say that poverty is alive and well in Australia, a lot of people go, no, that can't be right. We live in a country that we, we're blessed. We shouldn't have this problem. And yet for three million Australians right now, or one in eight people, we're living below the poverty line. It's a lot of people. 
731,000 children under the age of 15 are living in homes today that are affected by poverty. Um, Children are going to school without food. They're going to school without the right equipment. They're going to school without um, the necessary clothing, the uniforms. They're missing out on going on excursions because their parents can't afford to pay for things. That's painting a very, very powerful message in their mind that they're different. And so that's an issue for the generations to deal with. Let me paint a picture. It could be your next door neighbour right now. That you watch them drive in and out of their homes, in their car, and that's what you see. They've got their house. They might even have two cars. And yet what you don't see is the strain on their marriage because of the financial pressure that they're going through right now. What you don't see are the children living in fear. They don't feel safe because mum and dad are always fighting about money. What you don't see is the shopping trips filled with dread and fear instead of shopping trolleys being filled with groceries and food. You know, it could be an elderly neighbour of yours that are living right behind your fence right now and throughout the day you watch them pottering around the backyard, the gardening, doing the gardening and you think everything's fine. But what you don't see is the fact they're sitting in a cold, dark house at night time because they can't afford to pay their electricity bills. You know, you could see, a, a, we talked about domestic violence, you know, so many women are making courageous decisions to step out of abuse. Good on them, I say. They deserve better. But what they're doing is they're saying, I am going to give up my financial freedom for my own protection and the protection of our kids. You see, in Australia, poverty is hidden. It's a lot more hidden, but it's still very real and it's affecting many, many lives today. In fact, what we have identified is the fact that poverty is not a financial issue. Poverty is not an emotional issue. Poverty is not a physical issue. Poverty is a spiritual issue. And whilst that might sound depressing to some, and I'm sorry to begin on such a sombre moment, there is hope. And as I look to you as a church, I see hope because I'm very passionate about this idea that the local church is the hope of the local community and the local church has been called to step into this brokenness and to to get engaged in this in this messiness to reach out into people's lives you see we all know that the very cornerstone of the gospel is that our justification comes by receiving God's gift of forgiveness and righteousness through Jesus on the cross. We sang about it today. The only thing we do is put our faith into that, don't we? That's, that's our righteousness. It's a faith thing. It's not a doing thing. We know that there is nothing we can do to be righteous. It is Jesus and it is Jesus alone that is our righteousness. And when we come to that realisation in our heart, something changes because we understand our own poverty our spiritual poverty, our spiritual destitution. And so what happens is that the way we look at the poor, the broken and the marginalised begins to change. We don't look at them with a judgmental attitude of, oh, another plasma TV screen, hey? You know, we don't look at it like that. We look at it from the perspective of there is nothing in this world that I can do to be right in God's eyes except to call upon the name of Jesus. And so we have that heart of compassion for these people instead of a heart of judgmentalism. The Bible in the Old Testament, many places, talks about the quartet of the vulnerable, the poor, the widow, the immigrant, and the orphan. And multiple times it says that it is the responsibility of God's people to care for these people, to step into their brokenness, and to help. And in fact, Israel got so off track with this that God had to, to sort of give them a little bit of a reminder of what is acceptable to him. And in Isaiah 58, we talk about the acceptable fast, don't we? And, and the, the story goes that Israel were fasting and they're saying to God, God, why aren't you hearing me? Why aren't you answering my prayer? We are fasting. 
We are pouring out on sackcloth and ashes. We are on our knees and yet, and yet we don't seem to be connecting. And, and God turns around and he says this. Is not this the kind of fasting that I have chosen to loose the pains of injustice, to uncord, untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. I'd encourage you to read that at your own time, but keep reading on because there's some amazing promises that God says to us when we do have this attitude. And see, God was addressing an issue. He was addressing corruption. And the heart of Israel had drifted away from where God had intended to be. So when I read this scripture now myself, this is a, this is a big scripture for me to get my head around. I, I look at this now and go, well, sure, fasting's great. So is worshipping. So is coming to church. So is doing youth. So is doing all the things that we do. But the reality is if our heart isn't breaking for the poor, the broken, the marginalised, those who are struggling right now, then one could assume that there is a disconnect between our heart and the heart of the Father. And that's something for us all to ponder on in our own world. You see, when we look to Jesus, he came into a broken world. He stepped into the mess, offering hope and help and compassion that had no limits. You read Luke 4, you read Matthew 25, some of these passages that talk about his heart for the poor. And I believe as a church that he has then inspirited us to be the arms and the feet of the heart of God. To be in this world, to be in with the broken, to be in with the poor, and to, and to offer hope and help and compassion that has no limits. As I get to travel the country, I get so excited to see churches doing so many amazing things, including here. Uh, Jim was telling me about some of the programs you're running here and reaching into people's lives. And, and for me, that's so encouraging because, because church is not this. Churches is what happens out there. You're connecting with people in this world. Jesus said, go out into the world and preach the gospel. And uh, today, people aren't coming in like they once used to. So we've got to go out to them and, and to reach into their, into their life. One of the questions we do get, though, is the fact that how can we do this practically? You know, we need tools. We've got a heart, we've got a passion, but we need tools. And, and how can we take that into the community and... One of the great things that I love about the work of Christians Against Poverty is the fact that we, our passion is the church. Our vision is to see the local church's vision accomplished in the local community. This is not about us setting a vision and saying, come and work with us. It's about us saying, how can we resource you as a church to reach into your community? That's what we are here for. And so we partner with churches like yours with our programs. And what we realise is that local churches do things absolutely brilliantly. You provide great community. You provide great discipleship. You provide great practical care and love. And there's this other little thing called the gospel that no other organisation in Australia offers, but you do. That sets the local church apart. No one can compare with the local church. But what does that look like practically? So with Christians Against Poverty, we have four programs that aim to tackle poverty and its causes. Uh, our first program is our CAP Debt Centres, which aims to tackle overwhelming and unmanageable debt. It is free debt help to people across the nation. And so we equip, equip churches to run part of the program, the relational part of the program, and we have a group of uh, specialists in Newcastle that actually do the negotiation with creditors, the budgets, all the things that go on behind the scenes. And we are seeing transformation in people's world. We also have uh, CAP job clubs which target unemployment and long-term unemployment in particular. So many people can't get work and they've lost confidence in themselves. So we aim to help them through the local church find out who they are and to get confidence again and skills to, to get job ready. And also we aim to tackle addiction. That's a scourge on our society. 
You know, it could be um, gambling, it could be online addiction, it could be shopping addiction, it could be anything. Um, but people need help in that space. And so we've, again, got a program for that. But the one I'm here today to talk to you about is CAP Money. And this is a program that's aimed to tackle money or financial illiteracy. We are an incredibly financial illiterate country, aren't we? You know, we, we don't necessarily know how to mani manage money well. And so CAP Money is aimed to help people learn about setting a budget, maintaining a budget, taking control of the finance as opposed to being controlled by money. It's a very practical course and it's aimed to, I guess, give the power back to the person. Take control. So it's a DVD-based component, there's coaching, uh, you get to do an online budget and um, it really is quite a, a good tool. We have uh, trained nearly 19,000 people across the country with cap money in churches across this nation and outside the church. And 18, uh, sorry, 87% of people said it either transformed their life or had a significant impact on the way that they manage money. That tells me that something's working when people are saying that about cap money. So we're very excited to be launching that here today. Uh, in your church, and uh, Pam has, uh, has, has become the CAP Money Coach, and so Pam and her team are going to run uh, CAP Money in your church in the last two Sundays of November, and that's exciting. So you can get excited if you like, because I'm pretty excited uh, about that, because I know the impact this, this service has on people's lives. It's changed my life, and it will change other people's lives. The reality is that you don't need to be poor to learn how to money, manage money well. That's the reality. So you might be sitting there today thinking, you know what, I am so sick of living week to week, not having any savings. Well, cap money could help you. You might be thinking to yourself, you know what, I would love to go on an overseas holiday or a mission trip or do something, be more generous in areas of my life. Well, cap money may be a tool that could help you achieve that. Maybe you just want to be a better example to the next generation. If I can do my money management better, then it, it'll set a better example for my children. So the point is that cap money can work for anybody. And so what I'd love to encourage you to do is help a sister out, right? So um, when Pamela runs the course, what most churches do, they run it inside the church first, and then they look at ways of how we can run it in the community. So some of our church partners run cap money in prisons, in schools, in community programs, all across the country. And so we would love for that to happen here too, where you look at how can we help people in our community learn to m manage money better. The reality is, and we call cap money the, I guess, the fence at the top of the cliff. It helps people from falling over the side into poverty. Our debt centre we call the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. So we help them when, it's, when it sort of seems too late. Because poverty and financial turmoil is actually destroying individuals, it's destroying families, and it's destroying communities across our nation. One in three CAP clients who come to us for debt help said they had either attempted or considered suicide before turning to us to help. 80% of our clients said that their relationships had either struggled significantly or had completely broken down because of, of financial hardship. And so we believe there's a real need, and we want to see the church at the forefront of this in our nation, in our local communities. The good news is that we're going to celebrate 3,000 families going debt-free um, this year, we hope. So since we've been going it, uh, since 2000 and, uh, 2001, I think, we've, we're just about to embark on our 3,000th person or family to going debt-free in our nation. We're going to see over 300 families go debt-free this year uh, across our nation. We are currently working with 500 clients and managing over $10 million worth of debt for our clients right now. I love that because God is restoring dignity, God is restoring honour and hope in these people's lives as well. But the other thing I get excited about and was just so thankful to God and to our local church partners who do this great work, we've seen nearly 1,600 people come to faith through our services. Um, and, that, and that's at the heart of why we're doing what we're doing. When social justice and evangelism impact and collide together, do you know what's possible? Anything. Anything is possible. And that's so, so, so exciting. Well, as I conclude now, I, I'm going to show you in a moment one of our 
uh, debt client stories on video. His name is Peter. He's a Queenslander. He's a good bloke. Um, and uh, I know you're going to love his story. But what I want to do today is I want to give you all the opportunity to get a free copy of our book called Nevertheless. Nevertheless is the story of how CAP began over 20 years ago in the UK when our founder uh, got himself into poverty. He was a broken man and uh, he had an incredible transformation in the local church. Found Jesus, found a new sense of life and he then dealt with his debt. And when he had got his life back on track, he had this thought from God saying, John, I want you to go and serve the poor. And so he established CAP in the UK, which has now spread to Australia, to New Zealand, to Canada, and dare to say very soon to the US of A. And so uh, across these nations, CAP is doing the same work with local churches. So um, to get a copy of this book, all I need you to do, some of you may have got a card in your information when you came in. On the left-hand side of the card, we just love to get your details. Um, I know that you're going to be inspired by this book because I was. I've read it a few times and I still get teary. I still get challenged and I still get inspired by the story. Uh, we would love to give you a free copy today. Now, I've got a little stand outside here. And when you finish today, come out to the stand and get a free copy of the book and I'll get the card from you. We just love to keep in contact with you, not bombard you, but just to share some of the uh, stories that are happening across our nation right now. So as you fill those out, now please, I just want to say one thing. I work for a charity, right? So we, we like to save money where we can. So the pens... They look good, but some of them don't, may not work, okay? So you can't accuse us of mismanaging money. Uh, so um, if they don't work, I've got some pens at the stand as well, so you can come and see me then. So let's turn to the screen and watch Peter's story. Uh, our marriage separated about five years after um, we got married, shortly after our children were born. I've got two boys, uh, Andrew was my first son and Nicholas is the second one. At the moment I drive buses for Greyhound Australia. Yeah, everything was alright until uh, I had um, an investment property I got uh, involved in by a company on the Gold Coast. I got notification that the builder had gone broke, had gone bankrupt. It was just awful it was having the child maintenance, living at home, and then the credit card debt was, was coming in and you know, I had pain to my chest, worrying about where the next dollar was gonna come from and all this sort of stuff. And that's when you really start to let go. And think, oh, I've, I've just done the absolute best I can and I can't do any more. I did think about suicide. I felt like I was a failure. I felt like I'd lost uh, all my um, self-worth. Yeah, I distinctly remember when I first met Peter, he was discouraged. He, he thought that he should have been in a better place than he was. It became obvious that he had a credit card issue. And then they asked me to get my, my five credit cards out of my wallet. And he, did, he pushed them across to us and, and we actually got a pair of scissors and we cut those up. And they'd done the whole five of them. And then, then they said, now, how do you feel? And I just sat down like this and I just cried. I'll never forget just the sob that came from Peter because it was like a lifeline for him and when we cut those, it broke something. And I cried and I cried and I thought, oh, what have you done to me? This journey for Pete wasn't going to be a quick one. We knew that. It was going to take a lot of time and it has. Obviously, you've got to be vigilant in, in what you're doing and you've got to stick to the budget, you know. And when you've never budgeted, it's very hard to adjust to budgeting because you just don't know about it, you know. She came up with, with ideas that um, I never sort of thought about. Um, so uh, the land went first. My dad would be very disappointed with me, you know, selling something that he, he inherited. It's not something that he bought. It was inherited to him from his father. She said, oh, you're going to have to sell your house. I thought, oh, not my house. I said, I've been here 20 years. I've been paying a mortgage for 20 years. And she said, Peter, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to put it on the market. So, OK, that's what I did. So I had to, I had to give all that up and I had to leave country living to, to city living. Um, I used to deliver hay on my days off to continue to, to 
pay my debt down. I've even done a little budget for my older son, Andrew. He had no idea. He was doing exactly what I was doing, spending the money as quick as you got it. It's taught me something to give to my to my son. And, uh, you know, you can't sort of say that Cap hasn't done anything for me. They've done just massive things for me. As, as happy as we are that he's on this journey to becoming debt free, the, the other side of it that just, um, I guess, delights my soul is to see a spiritual connection with Jesus. And Pete's made that connection. He's returned to a faith that he had as a child. I actually recommitted my life back to God because I, I just felt um, that I needed God in my life and I can see what God has done. You know, talking to somebody who is coming along naturally walking into his spiritual journey because something's been taken care of in his natural journey. He didn't have to be forced, it's just the natural next step. And I'm not thinking about dying now like I was, and uh, I'm, I'm feeling very happy at this point in time. My debt will be cleared in about four months' time. Just don't know how life is going to be when I don't have that worry anymore. It's uh, it's been a journey for so long and uh, I'm really looking forward to that time. They have saved me from possible death, really, um, and I owe my life to Cap. He's a good guy, and the good news is he is now debt free and uh, he knows what it's like to live without that weight and pressure. But I hope you can see from the story, we are interested in giving people hand-ups, not handouts. It's very much around helping people find that dignity and worth in their life again to say, I can make changes, I can do things, I can, I can take positive steps to improve my circumstances. It's a really inspiring story, uh, Peter's story. And uh, yeah, he went really close to taking his life. So, um, it's just so I'm so glad that he didn't, because uh, he's, a, he's a great guy. Well, I'd like to just finish today by firstly saying thank you to you all for allowing me to come today. I really have appreciated this opportunity. I hope this has been helpful to you. Um, I do believe God wants to restore dignity, honour and hope into our world. And I do believe with my whole heart that you as a church are at the forefront of that, that um, I'd love for you to go away and think about how can we be involved in something like this and seeing transformation in our community. Um, let me share with you a couple of ways in which maybe you could be involved in, in helping more people like Peter. Um, the first thing is we're all Christians, right? So we know how to pray, don't we? So I, I would just love to encourage you to pray for our ministry and for all of our church partners around this nation. They do go into some very scary situations some very broken situations. And so please, please, please pray pray for us. Secondly, as a local church, I would love for you to really get behind CAP money. And uh, look, do the course. Um, it will help you. And I know sometimes we feel shame and guilt uh, about the way we're managing money, but it's done in a way that is very honouring to you as a person. Your online budget is your own. Uh, no one else sees it. Um, so, so please take that step and, and, and get behind cap money and then go and talk to people in the community about it and say, hey, we can help you with money management as well in this church. There's a couple of very practical ways that you can be involved. The other way I'd love to just let you know, there may be some here today to go, um, how does this thing work with cap? How do you get funded and, and those sorts of things? So let me just share with you, basically, we do not receive any government funding at all. We are funded primarily by Christians across this nation, which is really exciting. The reality is that we, um, uh, we've turned away over 700 debt clients last year because we didn't have debt centres in all the areas across our nation where, um, where people were ringing in from for help. And that, for us, is a problem because... Um, not only are they not getting debt help, although we can point them in other directions, but the other thing that really saddens me is they miss out on experiencing the local church. They don't get to interact with the local church. So um, we need to keep doing what we're doing. We need to keep partnering and growing. So um, because of that, um, we, we have a giving program, two giving programs um, that I'll briefly share with you today. One is called our Life Changer Program, 
And we have over 3,500 Christians who give a small monthly donation to our ministry. Um, for some it's five, ten dollars a month, for some it's ten, for some it's fifty, whatever it is. For us it's not the amount that's important, it's the heart behind that. Um, but for the cost of one cup of coffee, you can have a, 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 an impact in someone's life like Peter's. It's, it's really quite exciting. Um, the second option is our vision sponsor option, and that's for people that may have a little bit more capacity, a minimum of $100 a month. And as part of that program, um, you get a personal email from me, lucky you, um, with behind-the-scenes news, insights, and access to further information about um, what we're doing behind the scenes at Christians Against Poverty. So there's two options for you today. Now, if you would like to take advantage of that, and please, there is no pressure either way. We just want to give you the opportunity, that's all. On the right-hand side of the card, you've already completed the left-hand side, and if that's what you want to do, come and grab a free book. That's great. But if you'd like to give, just tick one of the boxes, circle the number that you would like to commit to, and then put your bank account details, come and see me at the stand, and that's all you need to do. It's as simple as that. And if you don't have all your details, fill out the card anyway, come and say hello, and we'll assist you with that process. It is really quite that simple. Nothing more, nothing less. So thank you so much. Um, I really do um, want to say thank you for the time today. I want to say thank you for getting behind Cap Money. And I really pray that God um, gives you greater influence in your community um, in the coming months and years so that you will see more souls, one for the kingdom, uh, in Jesus' name. Thank you very much and have a great Sunday. One thing I've always appreciated about West Side is the fact that so many of you have a heart for expressing the kingdom of God into the community. Uh, there has always been in this place a, a desire to find ways to effectively and practically touch the lives of people. And that's been happening in a number of different ways. Uh, several of you have done it in incredible ways. Uh, the reason I like CAP is because here's one more way that the kingdom of God can practically be expressed people's lives and, and be done through uh, people like you and me. So uh, uh, I trust that, you know, that I, th I think there will be some here today that have been stirred by what, uh, what, what Scott's challenge is with this morning. And I want to say, if, that, if that's you, be sure to talk to Scott before uh, you leave today, will you? Be sure to stop by and pick up the, the free book, read that, but I just have a, can't help but think that there is somebody that might be stirred to think, you know, I could do this ministry. And if so, not, we want to make sure that we uh, find out about that. Anyway, my friends, wherever God takes you this week, and that could be a lot of places, you go as an agent of change. You go as an agent of life. You go as, as somebody who, who comes with a different story that really changes everything. May the Lord be with you as you go to those places. And may you have a sense of your partnership with Him as you go. God bless you, my friends. Have a great week.